Let me invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to our text for this morning, which is Lamentations chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Lamentations chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And let me just say at the start here, thank you for singing from your heart. As we sing together as God's people in our church, both members and guests together, it just sets a tone for the entire morning that we spend together. It prepares our hearts to hear the word of God preached. Though it is preached in all weakness by anyone who stands here, God uses by his grace, his word to impact our hearts, to change us, to encourage us, to make us uncomfortable at times and to comfort us when we're discouraged. And that's what we want. That's what we need as we come to this next text in the book of Lamentations. This is a special Sunday as well because it's the last Sunday of the month. This is when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And we also have a time of prayer together in our service as we'll all have an opportunity to voice some brief prayers. And this month around the topic of reconciliation, As a church in this fallen world, as a church that's connected to our local community and the neighborhoods in which we live, and as a church that's aware of what's happening in the world, we recognize that we have a great, great need for reconciliation. And we take seriously that God, because of his grace in reconciling us to himself through Christ, has made us ministers of reconciliation. And so we want this topic to be within our prayers to be praying for peace and understanding, reconciliation, and opportunities to minister to people around the world who are different than we are. This is a big part of what it means for us to live the Christian life in this present moment. And so it's my prayer that as we take this abbreviated time for the sermon to consider from this text what that life is like, that it will also inform our prayers this morning. So be listening as we look through this text together for ways that you can be praying around this topic of reconciliation and about the Christian life that we are living together in this world. It was actually 20 years ago, surprising how fast time is going by. I'm, I'm surprised that we are already at this point in the year. We're just chewing through 2024. But even looking back, I was surprised to realize that it was 20 years ago, actually in October, when a pastor, prominent pastor named Joel Osteen, published a book called Your Best Life Now. And uh, he published this book as a, a, a way to try to give a vision for what success in the earthly life could look like. And uh, the problem was that this book only made reference to Jesus once. And in fact, when considered as a whole, there was really nothing very Christian about it at all. It didn't center our earthly life in Christ. It didn't motivate us to live in light of the gospel. It rather kind of gave a Christianized version of what we hear most places in the world that the best life you could live now is the life of material gain, the life of being recognized or significant in the world. And therefore, as you can imagine, for Christians who rightly understand that our best life is not the life that we're to be living here, our best life is actually in a life to come, it created a real point of contention and alarm for Christians. However, as a result of that book, Christians did the right thing in doubling down on the life to come. But as we've seen at many periods of church history and in the life of the church, when we double down on one thing, it can be very easy to single up on another. We can shift our focus so much to the life to come that we might even lose sight of this earthly life. We might even, as has been the case with this book, perhaps as, as, as a group of people, as Christians, stopped asking the question, what about this earthly life? What about the best life that we could live now? What does that life look like? You see, there can be a swinging of the pendulum so that that question is almost considered inappropriate. It's a similar kind of experience to what we worked through together as a church not long ago as we studied through the book of Philippians, which is the epistle of joy, because a similar shift had happened at some point uh, in the recent past. Christians became 
concerned about any kind of pursuit of happiness in this life because happiness is in the life to come. And we stopped asking the question, but what about happiness? How can we pursue our happiness in Christ? Should we even do that? And of course, as we saw in Philippians again and again and again, absolutely. Because it is by being happy in Christ that we ultimately glorify him. And so this morning, as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper, and as we prepare our hearts to pray together about important things happening in our world, we have an opportunity to swing back a little and consider this question. What is your best earthly life now? What should your life be made of now? What kind of things should you and I be pursuing now? Should we have our minds so much on heaven and the life to come that we become, as others have said, no earthly good? Perhaps we could consider this more clearly this morning by noticing three truths from the book of Lamentations also in a kind of counterintuitive way. As we look through books like the book of Lamentations in particular, we get to see the ugly side of earthly life. We have been seeing the results of sin and God's judgment for sin, the consequences that come because of sin, and the way that those consequences and those judgments can utterly undo a people. For those who are new this morning, your guests for the first time, the book of Lamentations is just that, a book of lamenting about the sin of God's people in the Old Testament and the judgments that came upon them because of it. Judgments that were a part of God's redemptive plan because those judgments, those hardships, those sufferings ultimately exhausted the people, leading them again to find their ultimate hope in Christ. And that's how the gospel has come to us. As Jesus Christ came into the world to live a perfect life in our place, in the place of sinners like me, and to die on the cross in our place, in place of a sinner like me, and then to rise from the dead, to call me to himself, as he has called many of you and millions of people around the world to be special to him, that he would take them, take us into his covenant family. And therefore, this morning, what we want to do is look at three different experiences that were happening in the life of people in, the, in Lamentations or what's represented in Lamentations and think from the opposite. Well, then what is the best earthly life? What is the beautiful earthly life? What does it mean to live righteously in this present life if this is a picture of the ugly? What is the beautiful? I want us to see first as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper and exalt yet again our great need for Christ. The first, if you want to live your best earthly life now, you should do this first. Pursue all of your life in all that Christ offers. Pursue all of your life in all that Christ offers. Notice in verses 12 and 13, first just verse 12, the experience that's described or pictured. Remember that this book of Lamentations is a kind of personification of Jerusalem, the holy city representing God's people who are under these these temporary judgments and the suffering that they experienced. And it gives, it gives some language to what is our experience with sin in this world when sin trips us up and troubles us and we suffer at our own hands or the hands of others. Hear these words as they're described in verse 12. They cry out to their mothers. We're talking about the idea of children, this picture of children, the most, uh, the most innocent, if you will, or weak, crying out to their mothers. And what are they saying? Where is the grain and wine? As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city, as their life pours out in the arms of their mothers. Lamentations is sparing no graphic detail to drive home the very seriousness of sin and judgment so that we will prefer righteousness and blessing by walking in the grace of God. God's judgment for disobedience in verse 12 is really pictured around these, these three kind of portraits, and you can see them clearly. What does it look like to live the ugly life now? What does it look like to live the sinful life now? Well, first, it looks like hunger. Notice at the beginning of verse 12, they cry out to their mothers, where is the grain and the wine? 
hungry and in need, feeling the pangs of hunger and loss and deprivation because of sin and because of the consequences of sin. There's a second picture here of faint-heartedness. It uses that very word in our English translation. As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city. And then finally notice that it results in death as their life pours out in the arms of their mothers. This is painting for us a picture of what it looks like to live an ugly life now in this present life and world by living in the midst of our sin without regard for God's greatness or his glory, perhaps even without a regard for his grace, which is being worked in them by considering these sufferings. In, in the ordinary daily life that many of us have experienced, you can even track along with these feelings, though you may not have ever felt this kind of hunger. You, you may not have felt this physical faint-heartedness as though you're at the point of death. Some have, certainly through illness and other things, but really when it comes to this experience, it, it can be very much likened to the very real experience of depression. If you've ever felt the the clouds of depression overhang you. You have realized that in that moment, something happens. Something happens within your vision. Something happens within your heart. It's as if you become incapable of seeing anything good. Everything becomes bleak and hopeless. You cannot see through the clouds. It's as if, as if there's no light shining in. You just cannot see anything else. This is the picture that's being painted. This is what it's being described as to live in a way in disobedience to God and not pursuing all of life and all that he has to offer and he offers it by grace. You cannot see anything else. Where is the wine and the grain? Why are we fainting? There is no hope. Where is life? It's pouring out. It continues in verse 13, hear these words as well. What can I say on your behalf? What can I compare you to, daughter Jerusalem? What can I liken to you to so that I may console you, virgin daughter Zion? For your ruin is as vast as the sea. Who can heal you? You hear those words, right? That's the kind of question. That's the kind of desperation that is at the heart of, of, of God's judgment for sin. This is where it brings us to the end of ourselves. Though there is in verse 13 this desire to console people who are suffering, you get the picture. It's difficult, if not in this sense, impossible to console. Their view of life and the world is one in which there's nothing to compare it to. You have probably felt like this. At certain moments, you, you cannot see past the darkness. You cannot see grace. You cannot see hope. You cannot see that anything else can compare to your suffering. But nevertheless, the book of Lamentations exists not to leave us in our lament, not to leave us under the cloud, but to lead us to the light, to lead us to the light of God's grace, which is in Christ, so that we might come to the end of ourselves and that we might then look to him as the ultimate end of our pursuit that we would become the kinds of people who pursue all of life in all that Christ offers. That is to become the kind of people who intentionally take advantage of Christ. That's what you should do. He is here and he has made himself available to you. Whether you sit here this morning and you are a Christian, you belong to him. He has converted you by grace. He has called you. He has elected you from the foundations of the world and has ensured that you come into his covenant family. You should take advantage of him because he's made himself available to you. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, God has just not done that yet, but you sense that he may be working in your heart. You hear these words and they're resonating with you. Something is landing in the soil of your heart. You should take advantage of him because it just might be that he's making himself available to you. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper with the bread and the fruit of the vine. We are celebrating that he has given to us what is lost in sin. Mom, where is the grain and the wine? The gospel says it's here. It's in Christ. It's in the gospel. 
Again, there's a desire for consolation, but there's a feeling as though there's no comparison until, until the gospel shines its light. The good news of the gospel is simply this, that all of our sin and suffering can be seen in light of Christ's ministry to us through the cross. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross. Today, in many corners of the world, the idea of Jesus on the cross is old hat. It's very familiar. It doesn't mean very much. It's this cliche thing. Saturday Night Live makes fun of it. Everybody disregards it until, until you feel your sin. And when you feel the weight of your sin, when you feel the clouds of desperation hanging over you and you cannot see the light, you feel your need. And you find someone in Christ who has carried your sin as his. And he has suffered your suffering in your place. And that is why heaven is our best life then. Because there is no sin and suffering. And that is why now your best earthly life can only be lived in pursuit of of all your life in all that Christ offers. This means that what we will do is envelop our lives with Christ, that he would become not only the center, but the right and the left, the front, the back, the top, the bottom, all around us, he will be our life. That is what we are in pursuit of. Therefore, if you hear this and it resonates and it lands and you feel as Christian or non-Christian, this is what you must do. You must pursue your best earthly life as someone who pursues Christ. Not someone who pursues other things. Not someone who pursues materialism, fame, significance, recognition, but someone who pursues Christ. That Christ would become the all satisfier of your heart. And this is what we desire. Second, I want you to see that this best earthly life now can only be lived when we seek the truth from faithful voices. Again, we're taking this experience from Lamentations and sort of turning it on its head so that we can see the way the gospel answers the lament and also redirects our hearts toward Christ and toward his truth. Look next at verses 14 and 15, just verse 14 for now. He goes on and says, Your prophets saw visions for you that were empty and deceptive. They did not reveal your iniquity, and so restore your fortunes. They saw, in their prophecy or vision, they saw pronouncements for you that were empty and misleading. You see here the central role of truth, the central role of hearing, which we know very well in our church because we have ad nauseum talked about the gospel as a message, as an announcement. That the gospel is an announcement of good news. It's not a list of commands to do. It's not something that you keep. It's not something that you live. It's something that you hear. It's an announcement about what someone else has done for you. And when that announcement, by divine grace, works a miracle in your heart, your heart comes alive to it, and you see it for what it is, and you embrace it. The Christian life and all of life is centered on truth, knowing the truth, hearing the truth, but hearing it from truthful voices. Throughout their history, God's people have been plagued by false teachers, failing teachers who were deceptive and not truthful. See it in verse 14. Again, your prophets, the people of God, had prophets who saw visions for them that were empty and deceptive. They could carry no weight and they could lead to no truthful end. Their shepherds fed themselves, not the sheep. 
Notice also that these visions, these prophets and prophecies, they did not reveal their iniquity. Simply put, those prophets, those shepherds did not do the faithful work to confront them with the truth. This is the truth that we are confronted with by God's law, the truth that we are sinners, that we are in great need of grace to show us our iniquity, even in our daily lives. That's what the law of God does. It, it points out how we are going in the wrong direction. But notice, notice the real tragedy of what happens because of these false teachers, because of false voices saying untrue things and avoiding the real heart of the issue, what happens to them in the midst of their sin and judgment? They do not enjoy the restoration of their fortunes. What were the prophets intended to do? What were shepherds supposed to be doing in feeding the flock? Redirecting them back to their fortune. That simply put is, is the, the joy and the enjoyment of belonging to the God of the universe. And because of this, their fortunes were not restored. Instead, their iniquity was just whitewashed. It was just covered up or swept under the rug. I think it was last week. I'm losing track. The days are going by so fast. We thought about the image last week of a broken down house. I don't know. Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. The broken down house is a great image for us. Not only because it shows us what we are like as fallen people, as sinners, but it helps us to understand and get a grip on how we handle a broken down house. How you're going to handle your own broken down house, your own heart with remaining sin. Imagine a, a part of that broken down house or down in the basement if there was uh, water standing and mold growing everywhere. One way that you could address the problem is to just go down and, and suck all the water out and paint over all the mold. That's what these prophets did. They didn't confront the real truth or disease that was leaching from the walls of the broken down house. They just whitewashed it and covered it up. And in the end, it looks good. You probably can resell that house but the mold is not dealt with. There is still death in the basement. And this is where the people of God were left because they were not hearing voices of truth. This is a danger for us, isn't it? We don't want to be fear mongers, but we want to be responsible for the life that we're living in this world. This world is full of voices. It's full of everywhere you go, you're getting all these different competing messages of what's important, where you should go, what you, you should buy, how you should think, what your life and worldview should be. And if we are not disciplined and careful, those voices will alter the course and those voices will hold us back from living your best earthly life now. Your best earthly life now is one that is lived in pursuit of all of your life in all that Christ has to offer and without the voice of Christ ringing in your ears all that he has done for you and all that he has planned for you and all that he wants to do in your life and through you to bless other people and the world and to prepare you for the home to come. You will miss those fortunes because somebody else's voice is in your ear. This is a central problem in every church today. Because especially in America, because at this point, the voice of the shepherds of the church, they were talking about faithful shepherds and faithful churches, is not the loudest voice in the sheep's ears. Sometimes it's not even top 10. And that's a big problem. Therefore, what we need is more churches, more church members who are willing to be disciplined and sacrificial with other voices so that the voice of truth coming out of the word of God is the central voice of their hearts. It's the voice they listen to above all else and they judge all other voices by the one. If not, it gives the world reason to rejoice because the world, the fallen world system wants this very thing. Notice in verse 15, the way that this personified city of the people of God is received or viewed by others. Verse 15, all who pass by scornfully clap their hands at you. 
They hiss and shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? You hear the mockery. You hear the mo They're mocking Christ. They're mocking Yahweh. They're mocking God by mocking his people because they listened to the wrong voices and they were led astray. So the second application this morning, especially as we come to the Lord's Supper, we want to be hearing the voice of the Lord's Supper, which is the voice of Christ speaking to us his gracious good news, his word of truth and hope and, and ultimate satisfaction, exclusive happiness and joy in him over and over again, shouting over the other voices, through the bread, through the fruit of the vine, and nurturing our hearts. So do this if you want to live your best earthly life now in pursuit of all of your life and all of Christ Surround yourself with voices of solid truth, voices of honest assessment. Don't surround yourself with people who won't help you see where you need to grow. Don't surround yourself with people and voices that won't point out where you're going wrong and then direct you back in the right direction with them as humble fellow followers of Christ. Surround yourself with people who will give you the hopeful vision that Christ speaks to us through the gospel. Finally, if we want to live this kind of life, and we do, we must then live above reproach in the face of an oppositional world. Notice how this comes through in verses 16 and 17, just verse 16 for now. All your enemies open their mouths against you, here it is again. They hiss and gnash their teeth saying, we have swallowed her up. This is the day we have waited for. We have lived to see it. The opponents of God's people, because of their sin, because of the judgments coming upon them, had reasons then, as we just saw, to disparage them. They open their mouths against God's people how are they able to do this? They're able to do this here because it's clear to them that they have been living below reproach. They've not been living according to God's standards and they've not been living according to God's calling to depend upon him, to listen to him, to pursue all of life and all that he has to offer. And then they express their domination. They hiss and gnash their teeth. We've swallowed her up. They are gloating. They are rejoicing. They are scorning and they delight in their weakness and defeat. That last line ought to ring in your ears. The world saying to the people of the God of the universe, this is the day we've waited for. We have lived to see it. Why is this happening? Why is this happening to the people of God? Who would allow this kind of thing to happen? God would. God would because he has a redemptive plan that goes far beyond this. It extends from eternity past in the mind and heart of God when he made his eternal decisions and decrees of how the world would operate and what would happen and how he would bring it all to fruition. And he has even ordained this. You see that in verse 17. The Lord has done what he planned. He has accomplished his decree, which he ordained in the days of old. He's demolished without compassion, letting the enemy gloat over you and exalting the horn of your adversaries. It's hard to imagine this. It's sort of hard to reconcile it until we see the gospel result. Until everything in this tension comes to resolution in Christ through his cross with the announcement of good news and God's final plan in the best life then, only then can we understand why he would allow something so bad to happen. It was only because he was planning something so very good. But in the midst of it, it's a painful result. The word gloat, I learned, has its roots in this Middle English, which is a word sort of like glotten. It's kind of a weird word to say. But actually what it meant was to look sideways at someone. It was influenced by an old Norse term, glotta, which means to grin and show your teeth. You've seen a lot of villains in the movies do this kind of thing. 
grinning and showing their teeth as they are delighting over the failure or distress of their enemies. This is what God ordained for his people to see and his people to feel because he was up to something incredibly, incredibly good. And this ultimately will find its resolution in the kingdom to come. And we come to a close this morning with another text that we considered not that long ago. And I want you to hear this and care, let's carry it into the Lord's Supper because we want to be people who are balanced. We do know that our best life is then. But nevertheless, we do, according to Scripture, want to live our best earthly life in Christ now by keeping our eyes on what is to come. And that is simply that when you feel the world is having an upper hand, when the world gloats over God's people, remember this, Christ will have the last word. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20, this extended passage. John says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is what's coming upon the world. But for those of us whose names are written in the book of life from the foundations of the world and kept there, God refusing to blot them out, no matter what we have done, no matter what temporary judgments may come or disciplines or consequences, he's carrying us to the very end, to this best life then, we keep our eyes on what he has promised to do. And therefore the last application that we could take away from this this morning, and it's one that we absolutely must carry into this time of prayer as we pray about reconciliation in the world, is to keep our eyes, yes, on the coming kingdom, but to do so, so that we may gain focus on this present life in Christ. To take an inventory of our life. How are we living? Where are we going? What are we committed to? What is your life really? Is it a waste? Are you wasting it? You're just flittering around day by day, doing nonsensical things. Or is your life in pursuit of all that Christ offers by hearing his voice in the gospel and then living in ways that honor and glorify him day by day, moment by moment? That's our prayer. I want to invite those who are distributing the elements of the Lord's Supper to come forward now and to begin distributing that as I pray. And then once it is passed around, then I'll come back up and lead us in this time of, of celebrating Lord's Supper, and then we're going to have that, that time of prayer. If you're visiting with us this morning and you're a believer, you trust in Christ, then I welcome you to take the Lord's Supper with us and to celebrate this good news that's so central to our church and our lives. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you might be kind of seeking or trying to figure out the whole spiritual world and where should I be and, and, and what matters most and you're considering Christ. I hope that you will do just that, but not take the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper is a symbol that, that Christ lives within you. You have fed upon him. He is your heart and life. He lives inside of you and he is nourishing you. And that, that just wouldn't be true for you yet. Instead, I hope that you will pray and that you will observe and that you will ask God to give you everything that you need by grace so that you can believe in him. Let me pray for us, and then as I pray, we can distribute the elements. Our Father, we do pray that as we consider these truths from your word, that they would land in our hearts and that they would find good soil and grow, and that they would result in a harvest of righteousness and joy and happiness um, a hundred, a thousand fold, more than we could ever imagine. We pray that you would use uh, these words that we are seeing in the book of Lamentations and other places in your word to help us see our lives in light of the gospel. And even now as we celebrate uh, the gospel through the Lord's Supper, that 
we would do so with gratitude and with sincerity. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to think about where our, uh, the idols of our hearts lay and how we can turn to you more and more and more to pursue all of life in all that you offer us. We certainly do pray that you would continue to give us faithful voices to tell us the truth. And we pray that those voices would lead us to live lives of honor before you, lives worthy of the gospel of grace so that we may be useful to you and that we may be examples and witnesses to the world around us as they watch us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.